Hello, I'm Matthew Weinstock, Managing Editor of Modern Healthcare. Thanks for tuning in to the latest edition of The Checkup. The coronavirus pandemic has forced healthcare organizations across the country to dramatically increase their use of digital tools. But we all know that's not as easy as just flipping a switch. I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Nick Patel. He's Chief Digital Officer at Prisma Health, a large not-for-profit health system in South Carolina, to talk about this Herculean effort that it takes to make a shift to to being heav heavily focused on digital tools in the middle of a public emergency. So Dr. Patel, Nick, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Matthew. So let's start first. Uh, South Carolina is a new hotspot. Um, just tell us how you're doing. How's the system doing? What are you seeing down there right now? Yeah, we were doing pretty good with our overall numbers, but uh, recently we've seen a spike. Uh, I think a lot of it with people going back to work and businesses opening up again, but we have seen a larger spike. Fortunately, we're holding uh, on really well. Uh, we haven't filled all our ICU beds and we still have capacity. Uh, we're finding that a large demographic between 21 and 30 uh, is about 20 percent positivity rate. Uh, median average is about 15, 16 percent positivity rate. But we're finding a lot of patients are actually pretty stable and we can monitor them at home, which has been great. And of course, we do have. Uh, pretty high vent, vent utilization than our normal average pre-COVID, um, but uh, we're holding on. We're, we're seeing that, as you said um, elsewhere, that that younger gen population is driving some of these numbers. Mm -hmm. How does that impact um, your utilization and, and what you're seeing in terms of ICU versus admitted versus going home and, and self-treating there? Yeah, I, I don't have the exact percentages, but I can tell you that most patients in the younger demographic are going home. Uh, and, and that's great. And uh, like other states are reporting, those people who are sick, they usually, it's, a, it's very polar. It's either you have it and you've got mild symptoms or little to no symptoms, or you have very, very bad symptoms um, and requiring oxygenation and, and potentially vent utilization. So we have a lot of patients that are also non-ICU that are requiring a little bit of oxygen and support, but not intubation. Um, and, and then we have a whole bunch of patients that we're monitoring at home and checking in on them on day two, five, and eight and throughout their, either their primary care provider within Prisma or even externally to Prisma Health. Got it. And, and so let's talk about some of those tools you're using. I know mm -hmm. in March, as you said, when you guys weren't sort of at a, at a high pace, like high rate like you are now, um, you guys made a decision to kind of go full tilt into a lot of telehealth applications, digital tools. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how you just assessed what what you had and what you needed, what you didn't have at the time. I know like one of the things you had to go out and buy a bunch of webcams, as I understand, right? Yeah, you know, I guess one of the advantages uh, of this pandemic, if there is any, is that you kind of see it, get a warning shot across the bow, right? You kind of see it going across the country, across the world. Even the United States got early warnings of how it was hitting Asia, then Europe, and then hit us and starting on the West Coast and moving over. So we got to understand and learn from other organizations and understanding how fast this thing was moving and some of the preparations started immediately. Um, you know, one thing we knew immediately that we need to do is uh, stop elective surgeries. As you see across the country, most healthcare systems did that. And that was a tough decision for healthcare systems, as you can imagine, because that's a large source of income for health systems. Uh, but we decided to do it early uh, as a precaution uh, and safety for our patients. And also on the ambulatory side, we pushed to telehealth. Uh, so, you know, I'm an internal medicine doctor and, and most of my, I would say my average patient that I see at their age is around 55, 60. Uh, and, and they have a lot of comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, COPD, um, you know, autoimmune disorders, they're immunosuppressants, they have kidney disease. So we wanted to make sure they were protected. And we were doing everything in our practice already to sanitize and temperature check and all those things. But if uh, we had the opportunity to do a video visit, if the patient had the capability, uh, then that's what we were conducting and started to do immediately. Um, and luckily, we're already on the journey for a lot of this telehealth applications. Uh, we had a, a video vendor in place. Um, we didn't know we were going to scale it this fast. Uh, you know, as you can imagine, the reimbursement landscape was a lot different pre-COVID than it is now. And, you know, we were concentrating that really on school-based telehealth and a lot of things on the acute side. 
for example, our telestroke programs and our, our mental health programs. But we didn't do a lot on the primary care side or ambulatory side, uh, other than folks who did direct to consumer type of things. So uh, they got sick and they had used one of our tools online and paid a fee and got to do that. But now we had to scale it to everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, Prisma Health as being the largest healthcare system in South Carolina. Uh, we actually care for and touch 1.2 million lives a year. And a large portion of volume uh, is within our system in the primary care side. And we knew we couldn't just close practices. We needed to monitor these patients. We had to make sure they got their medications. We wanted to make sure we educated folks about it, answered all their questions and concerns. Um, and we didn't want things to fester. Uh, what we found was some people were so scared that they were having strokes and heart attacks and worsening of symptoms or not getting their refills or calling us. And then they end up eventually in the emergency room, which is where we don't want people to go. Uh, so we, we proactively we took that. Uh, we didn't have every single computer set up for uh, what's required for minimal uh, video visits like webcams and speakers and mics. So we had to go retrofit some of that and, and, and order a whole bunch of cameras across the whole system, which everybody across the system, uh, country was doing. And they're hard to find. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, and then you have to think about it with a webcam, you need a speaker with a webcam, you need a cam a mic. Luckily, a lot of these things are combined now. Um, and it made us realize, look, whenever we do any sort of clinical computer in the future, desktop or laptop or otherwise, make sure it has a camera on it and the mic. Right. I mean, if you think about it, you're not going to save that much money. And if you go try to buy a laptop right now, you'll be hard pressed to find a computer without a camera on it. Right. Uh, but healthcare systems, you know, when you're buying 30,000 computers, those dollars add up. And so not every monitor needs to have a, a, a camera on it. So if you save 10 to five bucks on a camera, uh, you know, that's what we were doing. But now we're changing that. And it's like, okay, any clinical computer, desktop or laptop, needs to have some minimal requirements to be telehealth ready. So a couple of things I want to unpack there. One is the patient population. But first, as you said, you weren't rolling out, you weren't planning to roll out as quickly some of this in the primary care space. What's that conversation like? How do you change your IT governance? It's not IT governance really isn't something you can just change on a dime, right? That's a that's a shift that moves very slow, slowly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've said this before. You know, if there's anything that comes out of this COVID crisis, is a modern day healthcare system. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, we had to become more agile. Uh, the typical uh, IT infrastructure and governance structure all has purposes, but. Uh, we had to pivot quickly and uh, we didn't really have time to have conversations about every single thing. Uh, but luckily, the organization and ITS and informatics and digital health stepped up to the plate and made it happen. Uh, luckily for us, we already had a lot of things in place like video. Most of our computers were telehealth ready. We, we already had a secure chatting uh, chat uh, platform. Uh, in place. We also uh, were in contracting with automated chatbots and RPM, remote patient monitoring. So a lot of things were in flight. It had already gone through digital steering committee and governance and approval process and got into the contracting phase. All we did then is work with our legal team and accelerated a lot of these contracts to closure. Um, so that was very helpful. So that's on the internal side. Talk a little bit about the patient side. Um, you said you're dealing with patients. You see patients who are in that 50 to 60 year old range, if I'm recalling it correct. Um, I'm sure most of them are accustomed to it, but not everyone's accustomed to a telehealth visit. How did you communicate with patients to get them um, fully engaged in this? Yeah, great question, Matthew. You know, South Carolina is a small state. You know, it's got five million uh, people in it. And you're 43rd in the nation when it comes to healthcare. We have a high number of diabetics, hypertensive heart disease and, and, and stroke. And, um, you know, we're also a very spread out state. You know, there's a lot of rural areas. And in that demographic, there's connectivity issues and broadband access, computer you know, access to even a smartphone, basic things that you and I probably take for granted. Um, and being able to reach out to that very vulnerable population, it really makes you think a lot more about the things that we've been talking about for a while, such as social determinants of health, right? And it was a challenge. A lot of the calls had to be audio calls, just telephone calls, you know, picking up a phone and just, you know, making a call. Some of them were video. Um, some of them we had to spend like uh, Geek Squad going through, hey, OK, click this. You know, they'll have the camera on, but the camera's yeah. up to the ear. You're doing a good ear exam, but you're not able to see the face. Um, 
But yeah, it, we had those challenges, but the, the nurses really stepped up. What you find interestingly enough is how efficient you can become seeing people virtually because you don't have to wor worry about the front desk check-in process. You don't have to worry about the nursing intake process for vital signs and other things. You, you know, the nurses were able to call in advance, get some vital signs if they had it. So a lot of folks have a thermometer. A lot of the folks we, we found had a weight scale and a blood pressure cuff. So we're still able to get those values Granted, those are not done by nurses. They're done by a patient themselves. So there's variability that you have to take into account. But overall, you're able to be extremely efficient. You also were getting very accurate med lists because people go to their cupboard and get their meds and put them out and look at them. And we're able to, and, and then it brought in family members that typically couldn't make it to the appointment. And right. so it made it. So there's some gives and takes when it comes to technology of making them understand it. But overall, it became a more um, really efficient visit. Uh, but patients, uh, you know, they really liked it. The biggest thing I hear all the time from my patients is thank you. Thank you for being able to even offer this. Thank you for reaching out, having a phone call with us, and not just giving up on us during this practice is closed or whatever. Um, a lot of folks love the video visit and they ask, hey, can I continue this after this ends? And I, I hope we can. I mean, a lot of it was that we, at the same time, setting up technology, setting up this whole thing, we're working with our RevCycle folks and others to lobby and help to get CMS and other payers to pay for it, right? I mean, we didn't want the, the patient to have to pay out of pocket for this. We wanted to make sure they was covered and get rid of the royalty and all the restrictions of uh, payers had previously in the, in, the, in the price parity that they had. So uh, they really stepped up. It took a while. I think by mid-April, I think, CMS and others came up with a final rule and they retroed it all the way back to March 1st. So we had a lot. I think I, we've done a, now uh, uh, up to this date about 260,000 telehealth visits. Wow. And by that time, we probably had 120,000, 140,000 visits that still had a backlog of billing. Uh, so, you know, our team stepped up. We also had to figure out what is the attestation statement, the correct attestation statement to put in, which included uh, that you had to include in your note that the payers were requiring start time, end time, who was on the call, et cetera, et cetera. And the COVID, uh, it was done during a COVID crisis, et cetera. Right. So we had to educate through informatics. We had to work with RefCycle. We had to work with IT. So everybody was all hands on deck. And, and, and then leadership from a CMO level, chief clinical officer, also helping push the information out. So I want to get to the, the reimbursement piece. But before mm -hmm. that, um, that communication piece that you're talking about to your clinicians, there's a lot going back and forth, right? During the heart of the pandemic, I'm sure even now as you guys are spiking, how do you manage that? piece of it so that clinicians, clinicians know what's yeah. important to look at, especially as they got to do some documentation. Yeah, it was everything from emails to almost feel like we're, you know, doing a bat signal, right? It was, we were, we were sending email burst out and I know it could have been frustrating in the beginning because it was so fluid in the beginning. Things were changing so quickly. You know, regulations were changing to keep up with the pandemic. Uh, payment reimbursement was changing. Documentation requirements were changing. Uh, so, yes, there were a lot of emails, but what we decided, we, what Prisma did, like many other systems, we had what's called an incident command. So any communication that needed to come out around COVID needed to come out from that command center. And it went to an approval process, you know, some of them I wrote, some of them uh, my colleagues wrote, and it will go through an approval process. And then it would go through a certain person who communicated out. So you wouldn't be getting emails from just random people from informatics or IT or digital health or rev cycle. It would be one a succinct email because we know that, you know, people uh, will get confused. <laughs> On top of that, we made sure that our practice managers and our administrative directors also reinforce that communication. So just in case you missed it, you would, you would get that. Uh, we also use texting, uh, secure texting to send some things out. Uh, when we had, uh, Obviously, with COVID, you wouldn't, you know, pe people keep getting sick outside of COVID, but we wouldn't let visitors come in just like any other system. And we wanted to make sure the patient family connection stayed there. Uh, so we set up really quickly uh, tablets on a stick that allowed you to have a video face to face um, uh, conversation with your loved ones. Uh, so we did that. We, you know, we didn't want people to feel isolated because you imagine being in the hospital sick with stroke or something else and not able to have a loved one at your bedside. It is 
uh, is very depressing and isolating and, and, and uh, it, it really reduces your cover time because we, we understand how much that connection means. And even though we couldn't bring the person in there, we did our best to make sure that they had some connection. So we set up a, a tablet to be able to do that. And uh, through actually our, our perfect serve partner, we had secure texting, but they also had a video platform that we're able to, to utilize uh, to do that. So it, it was very successful. Uh, but communication is extremely important at a time like this because, um, as you can imagine, we have 32,000 employees trying to send out bursts of information like this. You, you just can't send it and not expect people to take it and twist it and make it something else. So you have to constantly be on top of it so that people don't go down the wrong path and take what you wrote and, um, and change it. Uh, everyone has great intentions and trying to help their department, trying to move forward. But uh, communication is key through emails and any other means that you have. Right. Right. And so, Nick, in the last couple of minutes we have here, I, want to do, I do want to circle back to that reimbursement part, because you're talking about some great things you've been doing um, at Prisma that obviously some other folks have been doing as well. But, you know, we may see once the pandemic, once the national emergency declaration goes away, sorry, mm -hmm. some of that CMS flexibility on telehealth may go back, may revert back to where we were. We're seeing some payers already start talking about not reimbursing at the same pace that they've been doing currently. So right. your worries and, and what do you need to see out of CMS and payers going forward to stop yeah. from reverting? Yeah, I, I tell you, I've been pleasantly surprised with CMA Verma and CMS, and they really have kind of taken a torch and moved this forward. And I think to quote CMA Verma, it's like the genie's out of the bottle. It's hard to put it back. Uh, not only are they seeing results and improved uh, uh, readings and outcomes, they're also seeing that they're getting a demand from all their clients and, saying, and members. They're like, we got, we've got to keep this around. I think you're going to find a balancing act because you, you're not going to go 100% virtual mm -hmm. at this time. But if I see a, a diabetic, let's say every three months, but I can start doing some virtual check-ins in between that or using remote patient monitoring or the chat bot to continuously have a digital encounter with that person in between the office encounter. Um, so I think there's ability to do both. Uh, uh, I don't know if the reimbursement's going to stay one-to-one. Uh, -one. I, I, I seriously doubt it. I hope it does, as many people do. But even if it's 80% or better, uh, I think it, it, helps, uh, with, it helps the patient and it helps the provider continue to support solutions like this and these type of tools. Uh, so hopefully more to come on that. I know just like us, uh, many systems are lobbying uh, our state and federal agencies to keep this going. Um, and COVID-19 is not going to go away anytime soon. Even if we have a perfect vaccine coming out, you're going to have to have a large percentage of the population get that vaccine. Uh, you know, at least 80 percent or higher, some numbers that I've heard to be able to get out of this crisis. And it needs to be effective. And question is, how long does the immunity stay around after vaccination? Do we need to, is this an annual shot we'll have to get? Or is it just going to go away like SARS? Uh, is it like influenza where you're going to multiple strains and you need an annual shot, but you could still get it? So it's, it's so many out, you know, outstanding questions right now. So I don't think there's any, uh, we haven't seen anything recently that says we're going to step back and go back to normal business. As you can see with across the whole nation, our numbers are surging. Right. Um, and so I, I think the last thing they would do is to say no more telehealth. Okay. I think we're probably going to maybe have that conversation again, maybe in the summer of next year. Uh, by then, we'll hopefully be out of this. But uh, I, I don't think they're going to do anything drastic anytime soon. Well, well, you and I will have to stay tuned and, and see how it all rolls out. But Nick, right. we really appreciate your time today. Um, we'd love to stay in touch with some of the things you're working on there at Prisma. Yeah. And definitely stay safe as South Carolina goes through um, this surge. So, Great. Thank you, Matthew. You, you guys, you and your family, please stay safe also. Thank you very much.